Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Melina Rizek. I'm a reporter with the New York Times. And I'm Julie Cohen, one of the directors of My Name is Polly Murray. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys were here to share in this incredible film. Um, Julie, I want to start by, oh, I'll say, first of all, you guys, there will be some time, I think, for a little bit of your questions at the end. So if you've got burning questions, think about them and shout them out at the end when I give you the cue. Um, but I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the origins of this film because it had an untraditional path to being. It kind of came from your last movie, right? RBG. Uh, it did. It came through the last movie via this very theater, actually, in a um, in an unusual art story. Yes. So um, as you saw in the film, um, RBG, as a young lawyer, put Pauly's name on the first brief that uh, then lawyer Ginsburg wrote for the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, it was towards the end of our research on the RBG film that we became aware of that fact and noted that uh, it was um, I interesting and, and saw from researching, actually, we, we never, that was after we had already interviewed Justice Ginsburg, so we never uh, got a chance to, to talk to her about it until we were making this film. Um, but it was in the period of, we had done a little research and understood why it was, as we showed in the film, the ideas that Polly had developed. Um, and it was in promoting RBG, it was actually at a Q&A, much like this one, um, in, in the Angelica, where a young woman lawyer in New York asked the question like, oh, I've seen this film and now I know whose shoulders I stand on. I'm wondering whose shoulders did RBG stand for, uh, stand on? And I have to ask the question. I said, actually, there's, a, there's an answer for that. And I started to say a little bit about what I knew about Polly Murray's role in Justice Ginsburg's work. And I did note that as I was talking, it sounded like I was pitching, uh, pitching a doc, um, which led uh, me and Betsy West, my directing partner on this film, to then do a little uh, Googling on... Polly Murray and um, start to read up and learn a bit more about the myriad of things that Polly had done, leading us to be somewhat astounded that we didn't know about this incredible uh, figure. And it, it was, you know, what we thought, could we really make a film about this person who's died such a long time ago? And that's when um, we started to look into the archive and found all of the incredible audio and uh, eventually some video as well. So you hear that? Those audience Q&A questions, they really <laughs> matter. Get them ready. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that's so fascinating, I think, about Polly Murray is that I think you're clearly not alone in feeling like, you know, um, a, a, a well-educated person who's curious about the world and certainly curious about feminism and women's history and civil rights, and yet this was a big gaping hole uh, in your knowledge, as it has been, I think, for a lot of people who are perhaps coming to this film or coming to some of the, the biographies of Polly Murray that have come up in the recent years. So how did you feel when you started to realize, you know, this is something that a lot of people don't know about, and yet this is a person who, as you know, we heard in the movie, was the architect of so much of our lives today? Yeah, I would say I felt confused and naive. Like, there's something about going through your life and your whole education, and you think, like, yeah, I basically know 20th century American history. I got the basics. I went to school. I talked to uh, people about such things. Um, so I guess I felt, I, I, I think, every, uh, you know, a, a number of us that worked in this felt like, wow, I, it, I feel like gave me a new understanding for how much we often miss when, uh, and we kind of, uh, you know, it's like the, you don't know what you don't know. And I feel like this made, th this project really clarified it, that in my mind, like took away a lot of certainty about uh, things I understand and remind you, reminds me, um, you know, how much it takes to really, because it's, it's not as if Pauli Murray got no attention, um, you know, uh, Academics, particularly black women academics, have been writing about Pauli Murray for many decades. Um, in fact, I went back to a co college course book I had in like the philosophy of feminism and saw Pauli's name mentioned a few times. There was a great New Yorker piece in 2017 about Pauli Murray, which when we started talking to people, people about that, a number of people are like, oh, isn't that that person that I read about? 
but you know, it takes a lot to penetrate and there's like lots that we don't know. Yeah, and I, I mean, to that point, I mean, Polly her, was a person who put her own, Polly's own stories out, Polly's own voice out. You know, Polly wrote a memoir, Polly wrote poetry, Polly, of course, as we saw in the film, was um, wrote so many letters. And it's not that Polly was undiscovered, as you said, but there was some ways in which Polly was buried. And then what you discovered when you went to this incredible trove of material that Polly had prepared uh, and donated to Harvard, you know, tell a little bit about what that contained because it wasn't just, you know, Polly's speeches or legal writings. There was a lot of personal material there too, right? Yeah, I mean, it was a, it, it was an amazing archive. Um, it was, yes, it was pretty much every paper that Polly wrote in, you know, college and law school and notes on writing that, the, you know, books that she was working on and notes on the manuscript, but there were also all these uh, diaries and journals that were handwritten. There were the letters to the doctors. Um, there were the audio cassettes, you know, you're hearing in there um, recorded portions of uh, Polly's autobiography, Song in a Weary Throat, which actually um, we found in a, a different archive. I don't know if by any chance our uh, production assistant Amira Williams is here, <laughs> um, which Amira Williams, uh, it's, I, can't, I can't see the audience, which is uh, there, this thing there, um, uh, which Amira Williams found at an uh, um, archive at, at, in Maryland. I, I do need to interrupt to like recognize a couple other film team members here. I know Claudia Lopez, our archival producer, is here. I believe our I believe Hillary Crow, associate producer. I don't know if Claudia Rashke is here. Uh, perhaps Ariel Schwedbeck. So, um, but um, in the Harvard archives in the Schlesinger, there were also um, audio tapes. You know, when Pauly would get interviewed by a journalist, like. They show up at the house, and Polly has like a cassette tape ready to go to double record the thing and save it for for the collection. A, a really unusual. A, a lot of Polly's saving tactics were quite unusual, especially for their day. The one that really always blows me away is um, the photo of Polly climbing up that boxcar when in, during the riding the rails trip. I mean, you know, this is 1933. It's interesting when you're kind of leading a hobo life to have a camera with you anyway at that era. But the amazing thing of like having to hand your camera off to someone like, oh, I'm going to climb up on that train. Would you just snap a picture of me so that I could save it for my, you know, Instagram feed? Like this was this was just another way that Polly was ahead of the times. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I spoke to uh, your producer, Talia Bridges McMahon, uh, one thing that she said that astounded me was, you know, you mentioned the letters. Not only were the letters that Polly received in the archive, Polly made copies of her own letters. I don't know if she used some mimeographs or what, <laughs> like, uh, but but she had both, Polly had both, excuse me, sometimes I say she when I mean to say Polly, so I'm working on that. But so Polly had both sides of the letters, which is, you know, Polly really felt like all of Polly's correspondence, all of Polly's communication deserved to be saved. Absolutely, including actually a few letters that had never been sent, like letters written in anger, and then across the top it would say, like, didn't send. And you're like, I actually see why you didn't send that one. <laughs> like, during the Episcopal priest period of Polly's life, there was a really angry letter Polly wrote to an Episcopal leader. Actually, interesting, have, interestingly, having to do with being um, inco incorrectly, as Polly was describing it, being, being called a lesbian, and, and Polly, you know, wrote a letter, how dare, could you, how dare you say that? What do you know about homosexuality? What do you know about transgender people? Like the letter says, and then like, right in big bold, like didn't send, but like saved it because someone might want to see it in my archives later. It was a very curated collection as, as you know, the, to the point you're making. So there was a sense that Polly wanted people to see these certain objects because in addition to having saved all this stuff, she also, excuse me, Polly also crossed things out and tore pages out of the diary. So there was a, a sense of what should and shouldn't be seen. So given this wealth of information, what did you decide? How did you decide what to focus on? Yeah, it was really hard and um, a group effort. There was so much in Polly's life. There were so many chapters, many, many that aren't included. Um, and basically 
we sort of broke it into little pieces. There was a point where Betsy and Talea and I kind of wrote down what we saw as the possible story beats, and I believe there were like 103 of them, and then had a discussion about what what would go in and what would go out, what wouldn't go in, and that sort of shifted uh, over time. But it was really, a lot of it was dictated by Pauly's voice. Like, if there was amazing, strong audio of Pauly telling a certain part of the story that just spoke to us, that seemed like it should go in. Other things that were, like, amazing accomplishments, but there wasn't necessarily moving audio to go with it or a poem that really moved us. I mean, we used, I think, kind of more written word that didn't have audio attached than we maybe expected going in just because we found often the words were so powerful that you didn't need to hear them. To you, If you read them, it felt like it had a power. One of the other things that's so striking uh, about Polly's life and about some of the battles that Polly fought is how resonant they are with what is happening today. Uh, to some degree, I mean, these are institutional problems that she was at the forefront, that Polly was at the forefront of fighting, and um, obviously those battles are continuing. So talk a little bit about how that might have also shaped what you decided to focus on. Yes, I think absolutely um, historical events that Polly talked about that felt like they had a resonance or even wrote a, wrote a poem about that felt like they had a resonance were, were things that we included. Um, a big example of that, I think, were the, the 1943 Detroit riots that um, we found some pretty amazing headlines and photography of, and Polly had written that great poem, Mr. Roosevelt Regrets. It just, you know, felt very resonant, you know, sadly resonant with things that are still issues today, and was another example of a uh, really interesting historical episode, which I'm pretty sure I never heard, heard about uh, before this, even though from our research we found it was actually quite extensively covered in, in the black press and somewhat, um, you know, in the white press as well. Um, we have a couple minutes now to take, to take questions. We don't have mics for you guys, so if you have a question, kind of raise your hand and I'll, and I'll try and call on you. Um, yes, over here. Um, really beautiful uh, uh, show about this, uh, a person that I was also unaware of. What, did you come to any conclusions about why we know so little about Paul Murray, <laughs> given all of the incredible impact that Paul had? Yeah, the question is, why do we know so little about Polly given given the amount of Polly's impact? I think there's a number of reasons, and that all play a role. I mean, you could start with racism, sexism, and kind of fear of those who appear to be gender nonconforming, as Polly uh, did, even if it wasn't something being publicly talked about. Um, in addition, uh, Polly's private life and love life which could have really been harmful uh, professionally and personally, um, might have led Polly to like lay a little lower um, than, than a, a public figure ordinarily would. Also, you know, there's a reason we talk about an idea whose time has come. That very phrase suggests that there are ideas whose time hasn't come yet, and Polly was having a lot of those, and it's, sometimes it's hard to get attention when there's not a whole a movement around around your ideas. So those are some reasons, and there are probably more. Yes, right here. Um, yeah, thank you for this film. It was beautiful. Uh, a couple months ago, I saw Summer of Soul and, and felt similar, um, a story that had been locked away for 50 plus years, and, um, and very few people knew about it. Uh, I, I'm wondering, my, my background is in writing, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the experience and the process of writing this film, particularly uh, a black story uh, and not necessarily being a black person. What were some of the things that you kept in your mind and the intentions as you were writing? Yeah, the question was the, um, the process of writing a story about a black main character as, uh, as a white uh, director. Um, you know, I think we write, writing 
the 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 main goal was to really be guided by Polly's own words. I mean, there's nothing in the film that's literally scripted. The only question is how what what to include and what not to, and how one organizes um, those thoughts. We certainly tried to keep uh, this film as autobiographical from Polly's voice as possible um and you know the team working on this um was uh, a pretty extensive team but on on top of the um you know wh white co-directors um the editorial decisions also are made by our producer and editor um both both african-american um we uh, i per expected perhaps we would have disagreements on issues kind of coming from our different races that I'm not going to say that never happened. It was maybe a little less frequent than I might have, uh, might have expected, but certainly like this was everyone bringing their perspectives to the table, but all of us trying to be guided by Polly's voice. I think the question of identity too is something that's so interesting that comes up in in the film. Obviously, people talk about the pronouns. You've heard me say she, which is actually the pronoun that Polly's family prefers to use. Uh, you guys tend to use Polly's name as much as possible, and even organizations that work around Polly's legacy, like there's a, a center in in North Carolina where Polly was from, that they use both she and they pronouns. So it's it's still it's it's a hard question to answer when the person themselves is not around to answer it um, to talk about that issue of identity. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I see a hand in the back over there. Hi, Julie. It's John. Good to see you. Um, wondering if you could put this in kind of the framework of your other work and kind of how you see this evolving from, say, the Sturgeon Queens to RPG, <laughs> Julia, etc. And secondly, you kind of gave a brief comment that the things that were left out were mostly about you didn't have material to use. I was wondering if you could shoot it again. Is there one part of her story that you kind of left on the floor that you really wish you could have included? Um, I, the questions uh, relate to connecting this to other films I've worked on, and all like all, often, in some ways, one film leads to the next, as RBG happened to, to lead us to this uh, film. I mean, if it's a deeply engaging, compelling story, it's uh, always uh, an honor to, to tell it. Um, as far, you know, Polly's story is particularly hard to answer the question about what you, what was hard to leave on the cutting room floor because there's literally so much that this person accomplished that is not in our film. Um, you know, being the first deputy, uh, the first black deputy attorney general of the state of California, um, writing a whole book compiling segregation laws, uh, working for the EEOC um, in the early days, uh, working to uh, prevent the death penalty of a sharecropper named Odell Waller. Like there's so many, there were just so many stories and we were trying to tell this in a somewhat coherent way that would fit into a uh, mo movie uh, format. And as I say, it was the sort of some of the strongest points that Polly made that really kind of spoke to the team. That's what we ended up including in the film. Anybody else? I'll, I'll bounce off that for one, one final point, you know, to talk about how this relates to your other work. Uh, I spoke with Julie and Betsy for a story that was in the paper, I think, today or yesterday. And we talked a little bit about that idea of the connecting strands. And you guys said that one thing that connects some of the subjects of your films is a sense of optimism, which is one of the things that is really striking about Polly's life. And this came up when I spoke with Tele as well, because this is a person who who received so many you know, obstacles personally so many of these ahead of their times ideas that were challenged, dismissed, just there was roadblock upon roadblock and Polly just kept going. And especially perhaps now, that's an important lesson to take away. That was one of the things that you guys talked about. Yeah, I mean, 
it's it's really Polly's Paul, optimism in the face of defeat um, is really I feel like astounding to to take in. Um, you know, there are so many rejections that Polly would have been justified in giving up, and that was just never <laughs> the Polly Murray way. And I think there's something, you know, it's hard to think of it as a lesson because we can, we can't all be strong all the time. But certainly, it's aspirational, and certainly, you know, Polly was always taking such a long view and thinking that the arc was going to bend in the right direction, and um, it led to some pretty amazing things. So even if it's not like an example we can all follow every day, I think it's something to be in awe of and to aspire to. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, the rest of the film team. You've been a great audience. Enjoy your night. <laughs>